And now please allow me to introduce our speaker, Nicholas Cox. Nick earned his Doctor of Pharmacy degree at the University of Utah and is now an ambulatory care pharmacist at the University of Utah Westridge Health Center and an assistant professor at the University of Utah. His practice and research focus on chronic pain, primary care medication management, and the pharmacist-patient care process. He has published research on the impact of pharmacist engagement in chronic pain management and pharmacist utilization of screening tools for problematic opioid use. His current clinical position is in primary care, a setting that accounts for approximately half of opioid prescriptions nationally. He is a member of the Pain and Palliative Care Advisory Group of the ASHP section of the Ambulatory Care Practitioners. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nick. Thank you, Tracy. I'm excited to be here, everybody. So just getting started, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Let me start by just going over our objectives today. Um, so number one, I want you at the end of this presentation to be able to identify opportunities for naloxone dispensing. And you're gonna see, I'm gonna break this into whatever stage you're at. If you're a beginner, if you're intermediate step, if you're more advanced, like what are some things that you can do to get engaged in more, the keyword there is advanced naloxone dispensing. Number two, describe the key points for patient education and the key rules regulations that may apply to your state in which you practice. Number three, I, you, that's great if you've identified some opportunities, but we'd hope you'd be able to develop some strategies to identify in specific patients at risk for opioid toxicity and or problematic opioid use. So I'd like to just start with some introductions, if you will. I appreciate uh, the introduction Tracy's, Tracy gave. As she mentioned, I'm a faculty at the University of Utah, and I, am, I have two um, practice sites. One is I'm an ambulatory care pharmacist, but I'm also a community ph pharmacist. I practice at a community pharmacy. Um, I do have uh, published research in pharmacist engagement in chronic pain and in opiate management specifically in opiate abuse screening disorders, and also the pharmacist role in the opiate crisis. Um, I'm not quite sure how this will go. I really to be, I'm curious to get gauge who's in the audience. So this is a little bit of a technology test, but also a question I'm hoping to get information from. I'm curious who out is out there. I'm recognizing there's some pharmacists. There's, I'm guessing there's some pharmacy owners. Um, is there any non-pharmacists? And feel free to just type that in the question pane, even if it's not a question. I just want to kind of get a gauge of who else is out there besides pharmacists and pharmacy owners. And Nick, I'm seeing some come through. We've got some owners, pharmacists in charge, technicians, pharmacist owner, pick, pharmacy owner. Perfect, thank you, Tracy. I'm not seeing them on my end, but I appreciate it. Thank you for passing that along. Well, and thank you for those who responded, that's helpful. So uh, quite a mix, so we have pharmacists and non-pharmacists alike. Uh, again, if I'm using, term, I'm coming from the perspective of as a pharmacist and s sometimes we're blinded to our own uh, biases or verbiages that we're using. So if I'm uh, uh, you know, coming from that perspective, if something's not making sense to anybody, please feel free to write out your question and I'm happy to address it. Even if that's mid-presentation, I certainly don't mind being interrupted. Um, and I'll t leave it to Tracy to kind of facilitate that. Thank you, Tracy. So let's start with some background. So do you know somebody that has been caught in the quote opi opioid epidemic? So I can show you all sorts of opioid abuse rates and death rates, but you know, the H is for human. And I guess my question is, you know, to really think about a personal story, okay? Whether it's a family, a friend who's overdosed or maybe not has an overdose, but misuses. Maybe it's a patient you knew. Maybe it's someone you know that's overdosed accidentally. I suspect that this has impacted us all. This is not just, this opiate epidemic is not just a national trend, it's a personal trend. So just take a second and reflect on that. And as we go through this presentation, I want you to occasionally think back to the the person that you're thinking of. Because I think this is, as you think of actual people, I think it'll inter help you internalize these some of these concepts a little bit more than just thinking of the global statistics. 
So here's just a few numbers. I'm honestly not going to belabor this point uh, because if you haven't heard about the opiate epidemic, you're likely living, living under a rock because it's it really has captured the natu national attention. So one is 47,000 people in the United States died of an opiate overdose. And this is from 2017. Um, and they have continued to climb nationwide. We've seen dips in some ways, but we've seen upticks in others. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, this number rivals the number of like suicide-related re suicide deaths in the United States. The misuse of opioids is associated with a two-time, in two-fold increase in the risk of overdose or death. Now, that's really concerning because of, it's anticipated that 29% of patients prescribed opiates misuse them. And given how much they're prescribed, their frequency, you can see here that a twofold increase may, has a substantial impact. Now, what is misuse? Well, it could be lots of different things. Um, it could be patients who are using opiates to cope and or psychoactive effects. It could be those seeking early refills. This is the definition of misuse inappropriately utilizing multiple prescribers and or pharmacies, those who are diverting, that one's a little bit obvious, and those taking higher doses or more frequently than prescribed. So again, it's a really simple background to get us started to just set the scene. Now, given the national attention to the opiate epidemic, we've really seen two big calls to action come forth. There's, I, there's multiple, but I'm really gonna focus on those that are specific to naloxone. So one is the CDC guidelines that came out in 2016. You may have heard of them. Uh, these have influenced uh, insurance claims, um, recommendations. We're seeing PBMs put rules around these. Uh, but these guidelines are specifically for prescribing opiates for chronic pain. And within them, they have a recommendation. And they say to, quote, minimize the risk of opiate-related harms, especially in patients with a high overdose risk. And one of the tactics that they recommend we utilize is to offer naloxone to patients. So we see here a call from the CDC specifically to offer naloxone to those at a high risk of overdose. This was given a category A recommendation, which is their strongest recommendation in the guidelines, meaning, quote, most patients should receive this recommended course of action. Additionally, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, they came out with a five point strategy to combat the opiate crisis. One of their strategies, specifically strategy number four, was to increase the availability of overdose reversing drugs, i.e. naloxone. They've actually committed $75 million in grant funding to investigate, educate, and increase access. So again, some really simple, brief background. What is naloxone? Well, simply put, it's an opioid antagonist that has no analgesic effect, so it does not you know, it itself does not lead to analgesia or pain relief. Rather, it reverses, it's an antagonist at the opioid receptor. Another word of say that, another way of saying that is it's an antidote to opioid toxicity. Without question, naloxone is somewhat of a miracle drug in a clinician's arsenal. It can save people who are on the brink of death, including those jeopardized by prescription opiate overdose. The opioid naloxone has saved thousands of lives. Now, it can be used in a few different ways. There's an intramuscular formulation, an intravenous formulation, subcutaneous formulation, intranasal, and inhalation, specifically through a nebulizer. I want to highlight the inhalation one for a second. Although that is available, that one is not included in recommendations for use in opiate-associated life-threatening emergencies, given that opioid causes toxicity by reducing uh, our ability to breathe, respiratory depression, administering it via inhalation, is not a effective way in, as using, in using naloxone as a rescue agent. So just, although I listed it there for thoroughness, we never use the inhalation form of naloxone uh, but when using it for opioid toxicity. From 1996 to 2010, it's estimated that specifically outpatient naloxone, not even inpatient, has saved 10,000 lives, okay? And I'd argue that that's not all. So, so from 1996 to 2010, the programs distributed naloxone to over 53,000 individuals. And again, they reported to save 10,000 lives. But that's just the overdoses that it saved. Because I really believe, and I'm gonna, I'll touch more on this, naloxone is more about, it's more than just this drug. The benefits of naloxone, specifically in the pharmacy, are about the conversation that it prompts with patients. 
which I think can have even more of an impact than saving their life when they're uh, overdosing because they can actually help prevent those situations from even occurring. Um, as I mentioned, there are different dosage forms. I listed the most common. We have the intranasal naloxone, specifically the brand name Narcan. We have the IM sub Q auto injector, FZO. And we also have a generic uh, IM subcutaneous solution, which is generic, um, that can be combined with a nasal atomizer uh, and or a needle. So you can create your own intramuscular kits or your own intranasal kits. So now let's talk about, that's briefly what naloxone is. Now let's talk about naloxone access laws. So these are laws that increase public access to outpatient naloxone products. They can include civil and or criminal immunity for naloxone administration and or dispensing. So basically these are laws that have been put on by each individual state that hopefully increase access to naloxone. Specifically in this presentation, I'm gonna really focus on those where the, the mechanism to increase access is by utilizing pharmacies and pharmacists and allowing dispensing without prescriptions. So in 2010, this is a map of the states who had uh, um, their state legislation had developed some naloxone access laws. That's what that NAL is. Blue is those that have laws. Tan are those that don't have laws. So this is 2010. 2013, three years later, you can see it's growing. 2015, 2016, you can see the pattern here. 2017. So you can see here, this is definitely a growing movement from 2010 on. And it's really been somewhat of a recent endeavor. Now let's kind of compare each of those states. So you can kind of see there's three different buckets of these state access laws. So we have direct authority, and you can consider that like a, it's a good, better, best situation, where the best would be direct authority. So that means a pharmacist has explicit permission to dispense. They have prescriptive authority themselves. Okay, or they don't need to prescribe at all. It's, it's essentially become a over-the-counter or behind-the-counter situation. The next best is indirect authority. And this is by and large what most states have. And this is usually done through some sort of statewide protocol or a standing order. And then there are a few states that have other laws. And there's, I use the term weak laws. That's a uh, language you'll find in the literature. I'm not, I didn't uh, give that definition. But these are any other naloxone laws providing protections other than the first two categories. So take a moment and just find your state. Please recognize that this is a 50-foot view. Now, key takeaway here is there's really some subtleties that matter in this. Okay, And I want to walk through. The, although that last slide may look important, it is important, and we'll talk about some of the evidence behind why that matters. What's really important is the subtleties in your state. And just through the nature of time, I don't have the ability to go through each state and outline these, but these are the kind of questions you should be asking yourself about your state laws. Is, for example, is counseling required? And if so, are there specific required points? For example, in the state of Utah, counseling when dispensing is um, without a prescription is required. In Louisiana, you must counsel on signs of opioid overdose, storage and administration, and emergency follow-up procedures. But there's a specific list of what needs to be covered. In other states, no counseling is required. Reporting, and if it is required, how often? Some states require reporting to the state yearly, others at other interim periods, bi biannually, et cetera. Is specific documentation required? So fair enough, you need to do it, but what are your documentation requirements and how can you document that? Can it be electronic, for example? Is training required? The training feature still exists in some states, but this requirement is decreasing slowly across the nation. For example, Oregon is one that does have a training requirement, or at least they recently did. Liability. Those quote unquote good Samaritan laws can vary by the state and they differ regarding civil and or criminal immunity. And they can also vary by the task. So you can have some um, uh, immunity granted when prescribing, but maybe not when dispensing, and maybe not when administering, or maybe for all three. But you can see these are variances that can occur across the states. Some states have patient assistance programs. For example, New York, they have a program 
where ideally patients should be able to get their naloxone for $40 or less. Sometimes it varies by the state, a state specific insurance program and otherwise uh, in other states it's statewide. It, there's some states that have more collaborative practice uh, agreement based states. And in these, if you're partnering with your state board of health, then there may be established rules. But if the state simply allows for CPAs about naloxone, then your rules are gonna vary based on the institution or physician group that you're partnered with. Um, in some states, again, there's indirect authority. On, uh, sorry, in some states with indirect authority, uh, naloxone accident laws only permit pharmacists to dispense naloxone through standing orders in an inpatient setting. So you can see there it can even vary by the setting where you as an outpatient community pharmacist, this may not even apply to you. So you can see there's a huge, even though you know I go to this slide, it looks like there's three buckets. There's tons of these subtleties that are really important if you're looking to engage in uh, advanced naloxone dispensing. So maybe this is an important question. Why should you care about naloxone access laws? Well, here's a really simple answer. States that have enacted naloxone accident laws and Good Samaritan laws have demonstrated a decrease in opioid deaths, that change alone. But, a huge but here, we, we don't always make use of the opportunity to make a difference. Even in states with permissive, very broad-based naloxone accident laws, practice has been slow. For example, in California, Less than 25% of pharmacies dispensed naloxone without a prescription in the two years following the state adopted very broad naloxone access laws. Similarly, in Wisconsin, 27% of survey pharmacists indicated that a prescription is required and were not aware of the state standing order. Only one in 70 opioid prescriptions are currently dispensed with naloxone. That is a that ratio, it takes me by surprise sometimes. And the author of this study, um, Guy, Guy and colleagues noted that these rates are even lower in rural counties, highlighting even bigger opportunity in rural communities. Only 33% of primary care providers recall receiving naloxone education. So this is the providers. How often do they get training on naloxone? Very few report ever getting any. And only 92% nine, have never prescribed it. So we're focusing today a lot on uh, dis advanced dispensing of naloxone where you can dispense without a written prescription from a provider. This is highlighting there's a huge opportunity given that 92% of prescribers have never prescribed it. Additionally, pharmacists report feeling unprepared to fully participate. There's two common reasons. One is a lack of training and another is stigma. Okay. A recent survey within the VA system found that patients avoid naloxone kits due to fear of being labeled as a, quote, addict or a druggie. So just a real quick soapbox on stigma. Uh, I often get a lot of questions about naloxone, and this is, I haven't heard this for about a year now, but I think it's worth co commenting about. Some providers are hesitant to, to prescribe or dispense naloxone out of fear that they are contributing to the opioid epidemic. They are, they're fearing that pa patients who use uh, opioids will feel that they can abuse their opioids more because they have naloxone. So this would be an example of stigma, and I'm not trying to put any blame on anybody here. I don't mean to use stigma in an accusatory way because stigmas are often a result of our own culture, experiences, and more, uh, but I think it's important we would be aware of them. And I like to compare this to diabetes, okay? Insulin could be looked at in the same way, that if I give somebody insulin, they can eat, more sugar and abuse their sugar more knowing that they have insulin. And in practice, I've even seen that myself, but I never hesitate to prescribe insulin for fear that they might do that. Similarly with naloxone and opioids, that difference in how we treat it, if we do, that would be an example of stigma. As a personal exercise sometimes, you should probably think, how do you treat the person on insulin compared to the person on uh, opioids that you're offering naloxone, that you sh should maybe offer naloxone to? What differences are there in your mental picture, in your counseling, how you help them, in your pharmacy setup, in your desire to intervene? Again, these are examples of stigmas. Um, again, not in an accusatory way. Oh, these were products of multiple things. But as healthcare professionals, we must be aware and look to overcome them.
So anyways, I apologize, the soapbox, I'll step down the soapbox over. But I think that's important that we are aware of the elephant in the room, which often, often accompanies naloxone, which is stigma. So keep an eye, why should I care about naloxone? They really can make a different difference. So if we look at those three buckets of naloxone access laws, the direct authority, the indirect, or the other, that uh, you know, good, better, best, with the direct authority being the best. If we look at the change in overdose it, per 100,000, we see a substantial change with the direct authority, where states are able to act more broadly and get more engaged. And again, I don't want you to focus on, you may say to yourself like, well, I'm in a state that's indirect authority, okay? And that one didn't have a negative. So that one didn't make a difference. That's not the case. What's really key is the engagement, okay? So we see here that the direct authority group, they had a statistically significant decrease, a 34% decrease um, versus those, the other groups, okay? And these numbers may look small, but given the frequency that this occurs, our incidence and prevalence rates, this makes a huge difference in over overdose deaths. And it really speaks to the value that you can have based on how well you implement it. So what can community pharmacies do? So I divided these into really three categories. Okay, we're gonna start out with some pad one level um, interventions that you could do. Um, so beginner, I like Star Wars, who doesn't, okay? So I really, I kind of done a little Star Wars theme here. But here's some beginner steps that you could do. For those of you who really aren't doing anything and are just looking to start to dabble, you need to start somewhere and here's what you can do. Number one, stock naloxone. One in four Thornton colleagues, they did a sample of states um, and pharmacies and they found that only one quarter, um, that one quarter did not stock naloxone. Fill naloxone when prescribed, okay? Um, he found that majority of patients of uh, pharmacies declined to fill naloxone prescriptions at least one to two times per week. Okay, they saw it, but they kind of just treat it as a prescription that needed didn't really need to be filled. Greater than fifty percent of pharmacies declined to fill naloxone one to two times a week. I just that's a, that another one of those statistics that really grabbed me and highlight this uh, lack of engagement. Number three. Counsel patients on every naloxone dispense. Don't give patients the option. I love this. It's a quote from a recent JAMA article, Journal of the American Medical Association, that came out just earlier this year. They said, quote, a universal offer should be made to provide naloxone at pharmacies, and pharmacists should offer naloxone as a part of a universal opt-out strategy to all patients who are perceived as having a high risk of opioid misuse. So treat naloxone as an opt-out not opt-in, don't wait for them to ask be counseled, proactively counsel everyone. So again, these are three basic steps that you can do if you're not doing anything that are basic. So now we move on to those a little bit more, the, I call them the Jedi Knight recommendations. Things you can do if you're wanting to become a little bit more of an expert. So <clears throat> help patients overcome access barriers. These could, you could do this through utilizing manufacturer discounts, uh, prescription savings cards. Additionally, community programs and resources. Two, focus on increased knowledge and comfort of your pharmacy staff. Greater than 50% of pharmacists reported being uncomfortable dispensing naloxone. This may not be an initiative that you can just roll out with an email, okay, or a, or a new policy. You may need to invest some time in training up your pharmacy staff so that they're comfortable dispensing naloxone. Um, number three, dispense naloxone without a prescription. So this is start to engage in those advanced naloxone dispensings. Really easy. Step one would be to investigate your state's naloxone access laws and see what's available. Every state has them. So it's just a matter of finding out what your state's, uh, those subtleties are. Again, what are the counseling requirements? What are the documentation required? What's the training required? And just learn all that and then develop internal policies and checklists for your pharmacy staff. Counsel patients and their family and friends using strategic education packets and checklists. Stop these packets. There's a lot to counsel on with naloxone. We're going to talk about this again, but the conversation is so critical. And so thus, have tools that help your pharmacists 
counsel and stack those packets. Maybe have, if you're going to have some, um, you know, patient education materials, have them there ready to roll out and focus on quality education. Okay. Um, let's see. And then finally, we move on to the master stage or the Yoda stage, as I call it. If, at that point, start to advocate for improved naloxone access laws in your state. Okay. Remember, remember, there's such a, this is such an easy thing to advocate for. The story is is there. We want improved access to naloxone. This is really about patients, and access is a documented issue, meaning that it is hard for patients to get access to naloxone. And there's evidence that increasing the access decreases opiate overdose deaths. So this is a really easy story to tell. Next, work on becoming a quote unquote hub for help for this type of patient. Okay, what are some things you could do? Participate in clean needle exchange programs. Now, check your state laws, because your state laws surrounding that can vary. Um, look into fentanyl testing strips. So if you're not familiar with fentanyl testing strips, those there's really three basic waves of the opioid epidemic. The first one was prescription opioids. The second one was heroin. And the third one is this illicit fentanyl. So if you're not aware, uh, in the illicit market for opioids, there is um, illegally manufactured fentanyl and its analogs. They're being put into um, opioid tablets, for example. And this, oh, the fentanyl is super potent, but it's very inconsistently done and it leads to very dangerous fentanyl so potent that leads to very dangerous overdoses and they're unpredictable. So a somebody who's abusing and getting off the street, their um, the potency of their supply can range from day to day. But fentanyl testing strips allow drug abusers who are using these illegally manufactured pills, they can allow them to test them and see if there are synthetic fentanyl or analogs in them. They crush the samples and they can test for the presence of fentanyl in its analogs. So this is something that you could offer and become involved in. And this is something that drug abusers are looking for because it helps them and it's a safety thing. Advertise that you're offering all these services. And I don't just mean advertise to patients. I'm talking about all the clientele, patients. Uh, I mean, uh, patients included, but also providers, prescribers, mental health workers, patients, family members. You have grandparents sitting in your pharmacy who are probably worried about their, some of their grandchildren who are struggling with this. We just talked about how prescribers feel like they don't have education about this and they're not prescribing. I know personally, I sit, my, my practice, I sit next to prescribers and I hear at least once a week, a provider ask me a question like, what pharmacy can I send this naloxone prescription to that I know it'll be handled right? They're looking for pharmacies that they can trust with these patients. So become a hub of help. And when you do, watch your traffic increase. And not just the clientele that you may be thinking of, but watch your clientele of lots of different types of patients increase. Next, you can start reactively targeting patients. So as patients come in to fill their um, prescriptions for opioids, you could screen them. So there's different tools like the brief, brief risk tool, TAPS, CAGE, Espert, and many others. So um, imagine this scenario, a workflow where a patient presents to fill a prescription for an opioid. While they wait, they're asked, your technician asks them to fill out a brief questionnaire. When completed, your technician documents those results and informs you of the score. That score can prompt you to action, such as to offer naloxone, further education. Maybe it could even prompt you to engage in discussions about abuse, opioid abuse treatments. The questionnaire that's right for you depends on your situation. There's questionnaires designed to identify opioid misuse versus opioid abuse versus risk of future abuse. Um, and they all vary subtly, but there's a paper specifically looking at the best surveys that pharmacists can use. And that's that bottom reference on this slide. But that's something that you could be distributing and learning about your clientele. And as you learn, then you could take more targeted action. Proactively target patients. So the first one is reactively, where you wait for patients to come in, and then once you see them, you uh, um, act accordingly. Or you can even proactively target patients. So imagine if you ran a report of all the patients at your pharmacy who consistently receive opioids 
with a morphine equivalency greater than 50 or 90 or whatever cutoff, whatever dose cutoff you want to use. Or you ran a report for all patients who are co-prescribed opioids with benzodiazepines. And then you proactively reached out to them and offered them a naloxone prescription. Okay. These are all things you can do to really enhance, and it works on, again, becoming a hub of help in this situation. Be aware of barriers. Okay, you're likely aware of many, even as I speak, and you're probably thinking like, oh, I can see some problems with this. And that's good. Be aware of them. Anticipate them. So the following nine is based on a survey of pharmacists where they said, what are your top barriers in dispensing naloxone? So here's some strategies that it were kind of identified, but also it highlights the barriers. One is those cost barriers. Help the patient overcome the cost barriers. Okay. And again, it, it may be a community distribution program. They may not even fill the naloxone at your prescription. Maybe you know a resource like your local library that offers free naloxone. And maybe you end up, the answer you end up doing is sending them, you educate them. You talk to them about the risks, the benefits, you do all the counseling, and then you send them to the library, for example, to get that. That's okay, because they're going to see you as the hub. Even though they get the naloxone somewhere else, you're the hub that helped them. Two, improve and increase patient education and help reduce the stigma. This is really about patient counseling, which I cannot undersell the importance of. This is not a drug to just dispense, and we'll circle back to that. Three, advocate for increased insurance coverage of naloxone. Four, additional training for pharmacy staff and prescribers. Okay, you could be the one providing that training for prescribers. This is specifically called for for improving. So, and I want to highlight this too. If you can train the prescribers, there's studies that have found that when a naloxone prescription is accompanied by a prescription, even though the state doesn't require a prescription. When it's accompanied by a provider, by like say a physician prescription, it increases the patient's willingness to accept the naloxone. And so there is some importance there if, of educating your prescribers. And as you do that, you're in a way marketing for yourself and you're telling them, I'm gonna handle these right. And as we all know, when you get one prescription, you ought to get more prescriptions. Number five, increase prescriptions for naloxone. We kind of just highlighted on this. Six, adjust your workflow for pharmacists to provide improved counseling. Increase the educational materials provided for patients. These could be homegrown. Again, this could be a stack of folders that you have that you're ready to utilize, that you don't have to wait and go print out that are just ready to use for patients. Electronic reminders and alerts regarding naloxone. And then develop your own collaborative practice. So one good thing about collaborative practice agreements, if your state is one that does it, as I talked about, there's a lot of subtleties in the state rules. If your state allows you to set up your own collaborative practice agreement, you can identify some rules and policies that work best for you. And by working with the prescriber, you can ignore many, many of the state regulated rules and policies. So where possible, consider developing your own CPA with the physician group. All right, counseling. So let me just take a quick second and talk about the importance of counseling. The real benefit of naloxone, I feel, I said this at the beginning, is not in the dispensing, although there is benefit to that. It's really in the discussion that prompts with the patient, okay? The patient, the patient comes in, and I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where I bring up naloxone, and the first question is, why are you talking to me about naloxone? I'm not a heroin user. And that allows me to segue into, all right, you're not, but let me talk to you about some of the risks that you currently experience. And I go through the risks associated with their dose of opioids. I go through the risks of their concurrent benzodiazepine use. I go through the risks of their concomitant asthma. And as I talk through all those things, I'm al it allows me a natural mechanism to bring up some of their risks and talk about some of the dangers. And then we can talk about other things they can do about it. But that conversation, which is so hard, it needs to come from multiple people. It's not enough their prescribers are doing it. We as healthcare providers also need to be having this conversation. And as they get it from different angles, it allows it to really ingrain in their minds and for them to internalize it. So I, as Tracy mentioned in the beginning, there's two handouts that are available for you to download. One is my slides, but the other is an example handout of what 
of something you can utilize to let your pharmacist work through in order to counsel on patients. And it's meant to be very thorough. Maybe yours isn't that long, but I want it to be more thorough in what, you, what it could look like. And these are the kind of things you could go through, where you can help the patient identify patient-specific risk factors, where you can help them identify what is opioid overdose. I'm just going to just pause here. I'm going to click through the slides because I've, I've highlighted here so you can see it. So this is uh, like the first page of that handout, okay? Where no, step number one, you assess their risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression. Again, this is not a patient tool that you would just hand out to the patient. This is meant for the pharmacist to be like buzzwords of things they could work through. And basically you're saying like, what are the risk factors for this patient? And as you work through these, it helps you identify and really sell the story of why this patient should utilize an oxone. Because that's often the first barrier of the, is the patient thinking, I don't need this. Other things you counsel on, what is an opiate overdose? What is naloxone in general? Then it says, all right, how can I avoid an overdose? And you can give some basic instructions so they never need to use it. And a reminder to counsel on the common opioids because they may not even know what opioids they're on or they may not even be aware that they're on opioids or that that cough medicine also has opioids. It allows you, it may remind you to counsel on the signs and symptoms of an overdose. Again, I'm not even halfway through, but this highlights how much there is to this counseling. It's such a critical conversation. Counsel on the steps to take um, in case of an opioid overdose. I'm going to re refer back to this, but you can see here there's multiple steps. And this is not just showing the, you know, intranasal and the lock zone, make sure they know how to use it, send them on their way. Because in the situation that someone would need to use it, they don't need to just know that. They need to know of how to check to see if the patient's awake, the importance of calling 911, how to administer it, and then what to do after you administer it. Use the trainer to demonstrate how to use it. And then counsel on the side effects. Counsel again on the steps to take after administering naloxone, um, assess if the patient can afford it, and if dispensing naloxone without a prescription, then it would you would, this is like a reminder for your pharmacist or your pharmacy staff to document it and say the electronic record. And again, you could tailor this to whatever your state access laws are. Additionally, have training devices available and utilize videos. And these are things where you could potentially develop a presentation and record it, and then sit the patient down and let them have them watch a 15 minute, 15 minute video that you created of say some PowerPoint slides that go through a lot of this. And you could also incorporate some of these YouTubes that I've included that gives you a very specific, clear a method of how to use utilize the Narcan nasal spray, intramuscular naloxone, a nasal atomizer spray, the Evzio injector, so that you're feeling very confident that they know how to use it. You don't have to, my point is here, you don't have to start from scratch. There are tools and videos that already exist, and you can you know, tailor it and dovetail it with your own, uh, own things you want to do. Again, what to do in, a, uh, in an overdose emergencies, okay? And then also explain good Samaritan laws and how those are often, and again, it varies by the state, but how this can protect the people so they can not feel worried if they're also engaged in um, opiate misuse, that they don't need to feel worried about calling 911, for example. These processes are not intuitive and they really need to be taught to your patients. Some final call outs for counseling. Who is naloxone education critical for? It's really not that critical for the patient. The patient is not the one, the, when I say patient, I mean the person who's utilizing the naloxone, who uses opioids. They're in, an, in a situation of opioid um, toxicity or overdose, they're not the one who's gonna be administering the naloxone. The education is really critical for the family and friends. And, so when you're talking to, say, a patient who uses opioids, the conversation needs to be, I'm teaching you so you can teach others around you. Better yet, schedule a time for the patient to come in with their family. Use checklists and handouts. Again, as I just highlighted, there is so much to talk about with the patient. Create an opioid, opioid overdose plan with that patient. And then consider how stigma may be present at your pharmacy. How are you communicating with patients? Um, as um, excuse me, how you communicate with patients is just as important in what you're telling them. Appropriate language can help establish trust and reduce the perception of stigma, which these patients are watching for. They're kind of trained to watch for it 
And it's there's a lot of reasons for that. Documentation, see your state laws for specific requirements. But here's like some example language. You know, maybe this is just a phrase that could be copied and pasted that you can just, it, it's something that's simple that could be put in. We can see here, in, in accordance with the naloxone collaborative practice agreement, the patient has been it's naloxone on this date at our pharmacy. The patient was canceled on these things. And again, you could tailor that into whatever you, whatever your policy and protocol is and the pharmacist's name. But it can be really simple. It doesn't have to be this huge daunting thing as far as documentation goes. There are other resources. So prescribedprevent.org. This was compiled by several naloxone access uh, and overdose prevention advocates because we've individually been re um, receiving inquiries from, they've been receiving inquiries from providers who want to make naloxone available to their patients. They didn't know how to do it. So they came up with this website and it contains pharmacy basics, general information, legal information, and more. CDC provides their vital signs on naloxone. This provides you with a lot of pharmacy and naloxone statistics to help further tell that story. NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has helpful information and resources on naloxone. And finally, I just want to tell like a little bit of a story about Kevin, Kevin Damas. So he's from Utah, where I'm also from. He is the owner of an independent pharmacy. And I'm mentioning him by name and he knows I am. I told him, I talk to him often and he knows I'm mentioning him to this audience. He is a, a Yoda, you know, one of those true masters in the Luxon access. He was involved from the beginning in our state. He helped establish the very first collaborative practice agreement in the state of Utah before there was statewide naloxone the access laws. He had lost a brother and it was something, he wanted to do something as a pharmacist. Um, he'd also lost patients to this. He had a delivery guy who delivered for his pharmacy, like took meds to patients. And his delivery guy kept bringing him news and obituaries of people that, who had died. And he was really getting emotional about this. And so he's like, I gotta do something. And he started by just going to addiction classes, support groups, to, just to learn. He talked about it uh, and he just got educated. And then he started offering the Loxone. And now he's definitely one of those masters. He has patients come in and he does a 30 minute PowerPoint with family and friends when they arrive. He did a local marketing campaign with providers, other clinics, explaining what he does. And he basically said to those providers, I want you to send them to us. Many people don't want these patients. I want them because we do it right. Here's what we do. I do education. We handle it discreetly. We take them in and we do a PowerPoint in a side office. We do family education. Um, he also, so in doing that, he create, established himself, himself as a hub. And now he says it has been clear. The financial implications have been obvious. He's got so much more business. He has patients drive from two hours away to come to his pharmacies to get naloxone because so many pharmacies aren't engaging in this. He, he gave me this challenge and I've done it. He said, go to a rural pharmacy, walk in and say that you want naloxone without a prescription and they're gonna look at you like they're crazy, okay? And he said, this because it's somewhat of a niche thing that people haven't adopted as they should. Some of these things seem daunting, some of the stuff we talked about, but when you really break it down, there are biteable things that you could do and you could become that hub of sorts. And so in his final call out, he says, if you're not sure, if you're not sure you should do this, if you're not convinced this will benefit your pharmacy, he said, go ahead and call him. So go feel free to reach out to me, the presenter, Nick Cox, and I'll connect you because he says it has made such a change to his pharmacy and his business. And he also feels like he's making a difference. So I just wanted to kind of highlight a, a case study for consideration. It's you know, a place where it's definitely working. So ponder on this as we end. You're a pharmacist at a local community pharmacy. Your community has been affected by the opiate epidemic and you're aware of three recent opiate overdose deaths in your community over the last six months. You've kept up to date on the news and the national trends, but haven't been involved much in harm reduction efforts. You recognize there's an opportunity for you to be involved and proactive and potentially take a leadership role. What kinds of interventions could you consider for your pharmacy and or services you could advocate for in your community? So I, I don't know if we have time for an answer, but this is something, a slide I really want you to internalize. I think this is a pretty common situation. I just want you to really take some time and, and ponder this. Um, what things could you do? Again, I'm not saying everyone has to be the hub, the master. Maybe you're the beginner, you're the pad one, but maybe you're ready to progress to a Jedi Knight, or maybe you're ready to be a Yoda. Here's an ABCD question for you to consider. 
which of the following are not potential barriers to becoming involved in the naloxone dispensing and distribution? A, time workflow to counsel. B, provider awareness of services I provide. Three, my state does not have naloxone access laws. Or D, all of these are barriers. Just give me a couple seconds to think on this. So this question is somewhat of a trick question. The answer is C. Uh, my state does not have naloxone access laws. And that's because all states have naloxone access laws. As I said, it was kind of a trick question, but I wanted you to think about it. Don't let your state naloxone access laws be your excuse. Figure out what yours are and engage with them. Your engagement is much more important than whatever your state says. But it is important that you understand the nuances, the subtleties of your state laws. So I have three concluding points. Number one, why should you do this? Are there financial implications? Absolutely. Be a resource in your community that the physicians know and they'll send patients to you and you'll take care of it. If you do that, watch what happens. I talked about Kevin DeMass, people coming two hours away. He doesn't even have a sign in his pharmacy about this, but people come 120 miles. They hear about this they want, and they want to get good care. More importantly than the financial implications, it's about making a difference. Do you ever drive home, and I do this, do you ever drive home and think, what good did I do today? Try this and watch the impact that you can make today. We're talking about reducing hospitalizations. This is the way you can save lives. Return to that feeling you had when you had your white coat ceremony. If you sit in a room and talk to 10 people, seven of, seven of them will have a friend or family who's been affected by this problem. Con con concluding point number two, there's a poem I really like called The Fence or the Ambulance. You may have heard of it by Joseph Malins. Um, in, the, in this poem, a town is faced with two options to help prevent people from falling off a roadside cliff. Number one, they can put up a fence to at the top to prevent falls, or two, they can park an ambulance in the valley to try and treat those who fall, okay? While the obvious answer is simply to build a fence, the poem provides a simple analogy of the importance of prevention. So it is with naloxone. Naloxone saves lives, but naloxone is really just the ambulance in the valley. It does not prevent anybody from falling. The conversation about naloxone can help prevent people from falling, okay? There is no one size fix all fix for the opiate epidemic, but this is certainly a role that we can take. And this is kind of gets at the, the, the reason for my title. I call naloxone the, the most overutilized and underutilized. It is underutilized, no doubt, as I've talked about today. And that includes at the pharmacist level. We are not engaging in our naloxone access laws or in advanced naloxone dispensing, but it's also overutilized. It is not the end all be all. Sometimes we sell naloxone as a solution to opioids. But as pharmacists, pharmacies, we can do more than simply offer naloxone. It's a critical step, but it can't be our only effort. And then finally, I like this quote, okay? Pharmacists are in a strong position to support these strategies because they serve as patient educators, provide recommendations for the appropriate use of opiates and their adverse effects, and can advise patients and their family members about the availability of naloxone. You are all in a strong position to make a difference. More than one third of the 1.7 million misusing opioids that uh, receive them from a pharmacy. That's a huge number. 90% of Americans live within two miles of a community pharmacy. We are one of the top trusted professionals, which I'm sure you've heard about and you're aware of that. Okay, but what are we doing with that trust? To me, this whole conversation about naloxone models excuse me, about naloxone models the importance of preparing to recognize health-related trends in a community easily missed when we have the nose to the grindstone mentality that often consumes the daily work of a pharmacist. As pharmacists, we often are nose to the grindstone. But if we can ever peek, get our head up and look around, and I, I don't mean, I recognize there are forces beyond our control that put our nose to the grindstone. I am a pharmacist that gets my nose to the grindstone. I'm not doing this from an accusatory uh, place. But if we can ever look up, we might find that we have the ability to make a difference, um, especially when we see things that isn't right for our patients in our workplace or our community. Um, along this thing, many of you may have seen the uh, documentary, The Pharmacist on Netflix. Uh, it's an example of a pharmacist who saw something in his community and he was stuck in, I think in the many situation many of us get stuck in with the nose to the grindstone. 
but he made a dip. He, I'm not advocating for everything that pharmacists did, but I think there is an emotional component that would resonate with many of us as pharmacists. So if you haven't seen that, I'd encourage you to check that out. But I think there's something we can be, we can be doing as pharmacists. So with that, that's the end of my presentation and uh, I'll turn it back over to Tracy. Wonderful, thanks so much, Nick. Um, we've got quite a few questions in the queue, so um, I will just take them in turn and, and uh, read them off and give you an opportunity to respond. Um, so the first one is from a pharmacist in California um, who has been dispensing naloxone since 2017. And uh, he indicated he always asks his patients who are on um, opioids if they still have their Narcan. Um, and if they have an unused unit, he chooses not to dispense a new box. Is that sensible or do you have another opinion? I think that's incredibly sensible approach to do. I think, uh, I, I think that's great. Uh, and maybe he's considered this. I think the other aspect of this is where is the, where is the nox, naloxone located? So for example, when we talk about like patients with asthma, uh, allergies and like an EpiPen, for example, we, many of our patients have more than one. They have one at school that's kept at school. They have one that's kept at their home. They have one that's kept with both parents uh, and, and, uh, or kids that have uh, split households. And I think that same principle can be applied to naloxone, that we need multiple uh, naloxone kits, one in their car, one at their workplace. One, and I, you don't have to go, you know, they need 50 or, you know, 20 uh, naloxone kits. But I think that's a conversation of where are you and where do you use? Uh, wh where might they overdose? And where would it be important for them to have one? And I think that's probably the, the conversation to fill that out. And if they have one everywhere, then I think the point he said is, or he or she said is extremely valid that, you know, we don't have to keep dispensing it every time. Great, thank you. Um, the next several are all somewhat related, um, and it's based on cost and uh, reimbursement. Um, so the first one is the problem is cost. We try to dispense with each prescription, but most insurances either don't cover it or have a copay, and patients aren't willing to pay for something they view as unnecessary. Amen. I agree. I think we saw in the established barriers, that's barrier number one. And I can I can speak from my own personal experience. There is no one size fits all solution that's going to be like, all right, everybody, here's how you solve this this cost. I think one has been alluded to. It's a discussion with the patient, and it's making them aware of the real risks that do occur. And I get it; they feel like it's not needed. I often will talk to patients, like I talked to them about EpiPen, and I because many people have heard of EpiPens, and I'll say like, if you if you had an allergy that if you had this you would die, would you get an EpiPen? And they're like, yeah, I'd do it. I say. Well, the odds of having an allergic reaction are quite low, but you still won't have one, and it makes sense. And I say your odds are often, are probably more likely. If we look at the rates of anaphylaxis compared to opiate overdose deaths, they're higher for opiate overdose deaths. And I say statistically speaking, accidents happen, and there's a lot of reasons you have overdoses, not just for getting to take too many pills, not through intentional mechanisms, and you don't know when this is going to occur. And the the phrase that Another phrase that I often hear is is effective is compare the cost to a funeral. You know, you think that uh, that seventy five dollars is expensive. First off, you don't need it every month. But if you think that cost is expensive compared to the cost of a funeral, that's kind of a more thought. And I do not think that's right for every patient. But I think there is this element. It's hard. And if if somebody figures out the one size fits all solution to a patient, but I think they ha you have to help them. And sometimes it takes multi multiple conversations. You have to help them internalize the risk that is real and is prevalent and is there. Um, and sometimes that takes a lot of hard talk and a lot of conversations. Um, and then the second thing is really utilize community resources. I think many of us are aware of like turning to the copay cards, but I think you might be surprised what's available in your community. For example, in, in my city, I am aware of three places they can go for free naloxone. And I suspect there are similar distribution programs. And I think a great way to start, if you're not sure who to ask, I would call the Department of Health and ask them, where can patients get free naloxone? So then when you get a patient that can't get it, you can have a resource, you know, after you've tried all your mechanisms, you could send them there. Again, you can provide all the counseling and still become that hub, but then you can send them to a free supply somewhere else. That, that's my, my best answer. I certainly recognize that that is a huge challenge. 
and it is a tailored and individualized approach. I empathize, but unfortunately, I don't have the one size, you know, the one size fits all solution either. Thanks, Nick. Um, the next two, um, very similar. Um, how should we address PBM plans that pay significantly less than cost for the naloxone? That's a good question. I, I, it goes along the same lines. You know, we can obviously always advocate for changes, but I think we're, uh, I'm not saying those don't make a difference, but, you know, that is an uphill climb that we're all fighting, not just with naloxone, but with PBMs across the board for a variety of different topics. I think one thing, as we just talked about, it's kind of a similar related question. One thing you could do is you don't want to take the hit. You don't want to lose the money. Um, if you're taking a loss, you know, look into sending them to a place where they can get free naloxone. You don't have to just pass them to the pharmacy down the street. And I think that's the key is don't just abandon these patients. Help them find a, a source where they can get it, like a community distribution program. And, and for some, these may not be close. So some of you may be in a rural community. And so there's no free site in this town of 10,000 people. But look at one of your major city hubs. I bet they have a free distribution program. And the patient, next time they're there, they can get it from there. Or some of those distribution programs are willing to mail the naloxone, and it's simply a phone call. So it's the same premise as the, as the kind of the, along the same vein as the previous question. I, I'm not advocating that you take the hit and the loss of money. I'm not advocating that you don't fail it. I'm just simply stating, consider the options and try your best to get the, the drug to the patient. But some of these problems, as I'm sure you're all aware, PBMs, I mean, that's a problem bigger than naloxone. Thanks, Nick. And then we've got one more. Um, what is the cost of the fentanyl testing strips and do insurances cover it? I don't believe it's covered under pharmacist initiated treatment. Do we then need a prescription from an MD to dispense it? Yeah, great question. So you'll see that's one thing it'll vary by the state. So the places where I've seen it somewhat effectively done is they've set up a collaborative practice agreement. I think you'll find that you do, you do need a uh, uh, you do need a prescription to utilize it. And again, it can vary by your state, um, but it's something that it, it's not a test. Let me be, actually, I'm going to back up here. It may be a prescription may be required to get it to cover through their insurance, but this really isn't the kind of test that's you're not doing a test to the patient, and so there really isn't laws around like a, uh, you don't don't think of it as a test like you're testing someone's lipids or you're testing their A1C because you're actually doing a test to the drug. So it's not something where you need a prescription to actually do it. These are things you could purchase and you could utilize uh, with the patients there in the clinic where they bring in their samples, or you could sell these testing strips. The testing strips can be expensive, um, but there are similar some access uh, distri distribution programs, but those are a little bit more limited. I'd say the conversation around these fentanyl testing strips is probably a little bit more broad and beyond the scope of this presentation, but I think there is mechanisms that it could be done, but it can be challenging. I've seen it done with grant funding, which is something that could be pursued, um, where you get grants to help distribute these and utilize these at your pharmacies. But again, this is not a test that you're doing to the patient. This is a test you're doing to a drug. So that kind of changes the, how we often think of as like point of care testing. It's not quite in that same realm. And we do have some issues getting insurances to cover these. So again, I, I would not rely on, I, I certainly don't think as a pharmacy, you should be eating the cost of these. Meaning I wouldn't say go buy a whole bunch and just start doing them for free. But you could look into selling these. And they, you know, I, I haven't looked at the exact cost. So I can't, I don't feel confident speaking to exactly how expensive this would be for a customer to buy it from you at your pharmacy. Okay, thank you. Well, that wraps up the Q&A. Um, Nick, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, we sincerely appreciate your support of Independent Community Pharmacy. It's obvious that you have a, a passion for this topic. Um, and again, also thank you to uh, Centaur Viles. Uh, for their generous financial contribution um, to uh, making this CE possible.